My name is Scott Stempson, and I teach uh, history of sport here at the University of Nebraska and a few other things. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Amy Bass here to the university. She's going to be speaking tonight at the Pauli uh, Lecture Series, and she teaches at the College of New Rochelle in New York, and she has a background in uh, cultural history, African-American history, sports history. Correct me if I'm wrong. All of which is true. All that stuff, okay. <laughs> All of that is true. And I did read somewhere that she's a Boston Red Sox fan, but I'll forgive her for that. Being a Yankee fan. 107 so. wins. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but the ones in October count, so we'll see that. <laughs> uh, and she has written a number of books, I believe four books, and um, I'm going to discuss a couple of them today. One, I believe, is your first book. It is my first book. Yes. That was my dissertation. Oh, is it really? Yeah, it oh, was. Unbelievable. Yeah, this was a, a great book. It's now viewed as kind of a seminal, I think, work. And, and yeah, it just means I'm old. <laughs> is, that, is that it? Okay. <laughs> Once All your right. book is a classic, you're well, old. It's, I, I enjoyed reading it because I, I saw a lot of what I teach and I, I wrote my own textbook for, for the class and so I saw a lot of the same scholarship in there so I was like oh yeah I remember that mm -hmm. um, so I was good to, it was good to see that again and uh, I guess what I some of the questions I have of you um, I remember when I first started teaching sports history about 10 years ago mm -hmm. and it was kind of first of all people said what is that a thing you know is that and so I'd have to explain, well, yeah, it's, uh, and I always sort of explained it as a cultural history, looking at American culture through through the prism of sports. Yeah, and, through the window. Yeah, and so now I don't get that question as much. I think it's a little That's more. That's good to know. I'm glad to hear that. A little more accepted now, I think. But from your point of view, um, what can we learn from, you know, from sports history as, as, as a culture in general and yeah. as maybe you know, race relations and, and that type of thing. And I think I think you can learn anything from sports history. I think it's a it's a profound gateway into immigration history, labor history, race and identity, ethnicity, religion, gender, gender, gender. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that my first book, not the triumph but the struggle, which is about the sixty eight Mexico City Olympics right. and civil rights movements and black power and television and broadcasting and you know so many things on the table um i really saw it when i was writing it which was as a dissertation originally as a civil rights book not as a sports book um but one of the things about writing about sports is you have to get the sports right mm -hmm. right you need to know what a long jump record means right. and you need to you need to get it's not just stats right you really need to to make meaning out of sports you have to understand the meaning of sports right. so I think that sports history is really complicated because of that, but I think that it's been ghettoized, and I think it still is to a degree. Um, what do you mean by ghettoized? Uh, ghettoized is it's sort of this isolated. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, I think that with, with the explosion of cultural studies and American studies and cultural history, you know, film was taken very seriously, and, and television and music, right, really right. amazing works on these things. And then there was sports, mm -hmm. and sports was sort of over here, and I didn't understand why. As, as probably what I would argue the most significant culture industry, um, not just in the United States, but, but globally, um, you know, looking at events like World Cup and the Olympics and what have you, why was it over here? Why isn't it, why isn't it you know, right. at the table? Right. Um, and so lots of us have written about that. Um, there's a long, I think that, you know, I think it, it got starts, it's got it starts with things like physical anthropology and physical education. So I think that there was some snark that it wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, real scholarship, mm -hmm. um, which really sets aside some of the amazing work folks were doing in the 1920s and 1930s in labs and in gym, in gym, in gym teachers and, and those mm -hmm. kinds of folks in terms of what they were publishing. So I think it's, it's been a long, tough road. But that said, I think that folks who write about sports in a scholarly manner and have for some period of time, we've had to do battle. And I, I think that that actually makes for a really exciting arena of scholarship because I, I pretty much don't feel the need to justify what mm -hmm. I do anymore. Right. Um, I think I've sort of achieved that point where, yes. you know what, either take it or leave it because yeah. I, you know, this is my ove yeah. and this is this is who I am. Yeah, I always felt like I had to apologize. And right. Then, and now it's like, I don't know. Or, or no, 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 let me tell you what it's actually yeah, yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, my first book, very much a civil rights history, very much an Olympic history, very much a black power history. You know, you flash forward to my current book, which is about high school soccer and is, is a narrative nonfiction piece. It's not a scholarly work, but it still has all that stuff embedded, mm -hmm. um, you know, immigration and refugee and, and government policy and community. 
Um, there's just so many things. And that once you acknowledge that, what a great way to get people's attention yeah. to study these things. Yeah. Um, you know, the sports page is still the most popular page in any, if you actually, you know, deem to pick up an actual mm -hmm. newspaper. Yeah. Um, it's a great way to have these conversations. And we do have these conversations, whether it's Serena Williams yeah. or Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. Absolutely. And that brings me to that point in my classes. I'm always trying to sort of link the past to current events, and it's becoming... Yeah. Easier? I guess easier, <laughs> I guess is the word. I don't know if easier Tragic, is the word. Tragically yeah. easier? Yeah, and, and kids are wanting to, they're like, you know, I'll talk about the 68 games and I'll, you know, the play and, and then they'll say, oh, you mean it's like, it's like, you know, the kneeling thing in NFL. Right. And, and I said, well, sort of. I mean, you know, it's, how do you compare that? What, what are the, the, the differences and the similarities? I mean, is yeah. there a direct line right from 68 to... Well, I think that there is um, a direct line, but it's a nuanced line or it's a complicated line. And I think that we have a tendency to, A, want to see things in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. No one's ever done this before. Um, and that's where I think some of the shock comes in. Right. When Cap takes a knee and people are horrified, it's right. ignoring such a long legacy mm -hmm. of using sports to create political positions. Um, and then I also think that um, you need to sort of acknowledge the historical evolution, and that's really our job, as to how these things build on each other and where the foundations come from. Mm -hmm. Historians provide context. We tell stories, but we tell stories in a context of time and space. And I think that that's critical to having meaningful conversations about the contemporary. Um, I also think that I always sort of want to caution students about sort of the then and now, you know, yeah. format, because I, I do think it can oversimplify. Yeah. Um, but I do think that way. You know, when, when Cap first took a knee, and my gosh, it's, you know, it's 2016, right? Yeah. August of 2016, when he still had a job. Mm -hmm. um, and people were like, why aren't you writing about, you know, Kaepernick? And I thought, because I already have right. in so many ways. Right. Um, and so I think that, you know, that doesn't mean that we, sh we, we, you know, we have to recontextualize it. But, yeah, it's a direct line because that's the way history works. It's not necessarily about progress, right, because right. that's ahistorical. Mm -hmm. But it is about change and, and the way it moves. Do you think that, and I, to, to me I kind of link it in a, in a way, that you, do you think that, that uh, you know, Smith and Carlos knew what they were doing as far as what the reaction would be, both immediate and you know, far-reaching as far as, you know, you talk about you know, carving out a new place for yeah. for uh, civil rights. And, and Do you think they knew that, or do you think this was something, and I guess that brings us to Kaepernick, too, do you think he, he knew that there would be this kind of reaction when he did it? I think that the consequences of political action can be predictable and unpredictable. You know, Tommy and John, Tommy in particular, were part of a broader movement. Right. And that movement kind of gets erased by the image, because it's one of the defining images, sure. right? The two of them with their, their black glove fists overhead. Yeah. The larger movement behind them gets kind of erased by the power of that photograph. Yeah. But there is, a, there is a movement behind them, and I think it's one of the most significant things to look at in terms of 68. The Olympic Project for Human Rights mm -hmm. had proposed a boycott. They had declarations of demands. They were aligning themselves with figures like Louis Lomax and King and, and what have you. They had a very powerful leader in the young Harry Edwards. Um, and, you know, you think about Harry Edwards, who was a graduate student at the time. Right. right? And I yet that, he was that young yeah, when I read that. I was, he's I was a sociology thinking, he's graduate student. Oh, yeah. He's, he's not that old. Yeah. No, he's not that old. Yeah. And, and there were consequences for him. Um, there's consequences for all of them. You know, Tommy gets kicked out of the ROTC. You think about their inability to get jobs afterwards, right. you know, not getting invited to the White House, which which has become an interesting right. contemporary issue for exactly. athletes. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone can really know what the consequences are going to be, but, but people like Lee Evans and Tommy Smith were very much invested in this collective movement. Um, yeah. And the collective part didn't happen necessarily yeah. um, because the boycott didn't happen. And I think right. that that's a really interesting thing for historians to study in terms of the role of the individual within a movement. Right. You know, there were guys who were afraid of those consequences and they mm -hmm. wanted to go. And if you really think about the way amateur athletes work, and that's what, who these guys are, we don't really know them until they win the medal. Right. Um, you have to be an Olympic nerd like me to know who <laughs> everybody yeah. is going into an Olympics. Right. 
And when you think that, you know, no, that 99.9% of everyone who shows up is going to walk home empty handed, um, you know, you're giving up that one chance. And, and as black men in the 1960s, those chances were rare. Um, so it, it was a, a decision of consequence. I don't know that anyone can predict, um, what's going to happen to them, but, but an awful lot of them were very politically invested in figuring out a way to use the athletic spotlight, you know, that rare spotlight right. to fit in with the other political awakenings that were going on in that decade. It, it kind of brings me to the, the question about Edwards sets up the boycott. It doesn't really happen. He kind of says, all right, well, we'll make it sort of optional. And those of you who do go, why don't right. you show right. your protest in some way? Did, how was the reaction between the two the, the groups, the, both those that went and didn't go, and then those who, you know, I always think of George Foreman, the famous right waving the flag, the flag. waving the flag, and and you know how obviously he was resented by the Absolutely. the other group, but you know, I think his argument was, hey, you know, and this is a lot of a lot of people have this argument is is this is one area where we've maybe done better than a lot of areas in, mm -hmm. in the culture, and maybe this isn't the right place for mm -hmm. this. So. Was that a valid argument? Did, did anybody think that that was a valid argument from the other side, or was that were they? Well, no, much Harry, Harry Edwards is is scathing in terms of folks like Foreman. Okay. Um, you know, athletes were really split. You look at like the men's Harvard crew team who supports the OPHR unabashedly, mm -hmm. and then you look at someone like Foreman. I think that the other, you know, the missing link in terms of contextualizing all of that is that the Cold War, right? Mm -hmm. So Foreman beats a Russian opponent. Right. Um, and so that's that kind of moment that there's also a long legacy for, right? Mm -hmm. You go back to Joe Lewis and Mark Schmeling when, yep. you know, Lewis gets to be an American. Right. Because, and I say that very purposefully. He gets right. to be an American right. because his opponent is, is German right. in that particular time period it's golden boy, yeah, yeah so it's democracy mm -hmm. versus fascism it's right. you know this there was more at stake than a black man beating a white man and right. and Lewis is is patriated for for that for you know a brief and shining moment right. um, where does where does that get one I think is the question that Harry Edwards is constantly asking and, and John Carlos in particular has some some really you know brutal statements about that you know mm -hmm. they throw us some peanuts and we perform I'm paraphrasing mm -hmm. um, you know, but then we go home and what? You know, we're just another, and, and I won't use his language, but right. but that's, you know, so, so really weighing the consequences of that. I mean, even, I, I think it's the New York Times when the men's relay team wore black berets in Mexico City. You know, the headline was not quite the same thing. Right. So, you know, how in your face with black power yeah. do you need to be, yeah. you know, to stay in the Olympics, right? Not get sent home the way right. Tommy and John were, yeah. um, but still make your statement. So it's, you know, it's complicated. Were they, were they the only two that were sent? They're the only home? two that are sent okay. home, right? Yeah. So Kareem doesn't go. Right. So that's you know, There's can you call it a boycott? You know, there's many reasons given for why the young Lou Alcindor doesn't go. Right. Um, did he need to go? Did he? You know, those are the you know, and that's lots of athletes have that. You know, right. you, you see today hockey players saying, "No, I'm not going to go to the Olympics." Right. You know, ten, the golfers. You know, golfers, they didn't go to right. Rio because they were afraid of mosquitoes. Yeah, okay. um, so. Yeah, there's always that, that question. The, you talk a lot of in the book about the metamorphosis from Negro to black. Yeah. Can you explain that just for yeah. the average person um, what that means? There, it's a political awakening. And the word black for the OPHR is a capital B, and it's a designation that you have to earn, right? Mm -hmm. So Harry Edwards calls Howard Cosell black. Okay. Right, that he's a black sportscaster. Yeah. And that's because of the politics that, that Cosell is putting out there yeah. increasingly. Um, so, f so black was a designation that you had to earn. Um, so that also sort of gets back to, to what we were saying before about amongst the ranks of people who were thinking about boycotting, were you going to be black or were you going to be a Negro? Um, sort of going back to the, the Uncle Tom imagery, um, the closing ranks, the, the accommodationist sort of point of view. Um, so I think that, that this rise of a black athlete, you know, Newsweek magazine calls them the angry black athletes. Mm -hmm. um, so that sort of goes hand in hand as a pejorative, right? That it's right. this militant stance. And the Panthers, you know, the Panthers are still in their early days of sort of evolving into what kind of imagery they're going to have. But I think that the black love fists and the sunglasses and the boots and the berets, things that the OPHR, things that, that Harry Edwards adopts, are very much within sort of this offspring of civil rights. 
that SNCC and the Panthers, mm -hmm. I know SNCC is breaking away eventually, you know, the, the, the sort of white cooperation isn't going to be wanted. The SCLC is going to be considered old school, right? right. King is going to be considered old school. Right. Um, and so you see, you see that kind of change happening and that this was a different way to be an African-American athlete. And I think it also has to do, again, with the collective, that in the previous generations you had these standouts, you know, Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis and what say, have wasn't, you. Wasn't Jesse Owens considered an Uncle Tom? But yeah, by there. that time. And he yeah. was in Mexico City telling right. them, you know, cut their socks. Don't wear tall black right. socks to run, right. and that's so stupid. That was, that was um, from a running standpoint. From a running standpoint, right. Standpoint. He just, yeah. you know, listen to your uncle. And he was, you know, you know, sort of mocking that, yeah. mocking his own, yeah. his own nickname from them. Yeah. But I think that, you know, folks like that, were individuals, right? We had these individual moments, and this was a collective. There was no one famous person until Tommy goes sub-20 in that race. Most people didn't know who Tommy Smith was. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that was really the landmark importance of the OPHR, was that it was a collective movement rather than this one athlete who's doing something that can be read as politically significant. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly Muhammad Ali is, is, is critical in this because yeah. he is both you know, the captain of the important single athlete sure. team, and yet he's also an enormous influence on the OPHR. And in fact, the restoration of his title is and their his, very first demand. His title is, at this point has yeah. been taken away. And taken that's away. one of the things that Edwards yeah. demands. Right? Absolutely. You know, and Absolutely. Brundage to be taken out of the... Yeah, Brian should be taken out. There's, there's six demands, mm -hmm. um, but the first is that Ali gets his title back because yeah. he didn't lose it. Right. Take and 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 you know that's offensive. It's you can you can look at that politically, but to a sports fan that's also offensive, right? <laughs> right? To take someone's yeah. title away that they won. Right. I think that's just mentioning Brundage. I think he always, at least he proclaimed that the sport should be above politics. Right? Yeah. It shouldn't be involved. The and games I mean must even. Go on. Going back to the Cooper, the Cooperton, I believe his name was the Frenchman, who kind of oh, Pierre re de yeah. revived the whole thing. He yeah. was always saying, it "Shouldn't be politics should be out of it, right?" But it's never really been that way. I mean, well, it, it can't be. I mean, the Olympics, the Olympics are inherently political. The, they, they were inherently political for the Greeks too in antiquity. Sure. I mean, the, you know, they were it, they were designed to stop war. Right. Um, no, de Coubertin, you know, bringing the children of the world together. Mm -hmm. Sport can't transcend politics right. when your entry point is a flag. Yeah. You know, from, from, from that point on, from the Parade of Nations, and, you know, they did an interesting thing along the way when the, the closing ceremony, um, the flags come in, but the teams come in as one. They don't come in um, as individual mm -hmm. national delegations. And, and that, was a, that was a later ad. That's right. a 20th century ad. But... It's interesting to think that, that sort of the message there is that the Olympics have ended right. these national separations, right. right, that the athletes come together. And I will say, I've been on the infield of a closing ceremony. It is a really good time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Absolutely. then they all go home to their countries yeah. right. yeah. and, and things march on. Well, that was a, that one of the arguments was why can't they, you know, compete without countries, right? right? And then that, you know, initially that was said, no, we can't, yeah. we can't do that. I mean, it's got to be. And like you said, that sort of makes it, Inherently political. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to be From the very get go. Yeah. And then everything else just gets lobbed on. Absolutely. There's a host city, you know, and the politics yep. of the host city. Oh, Mexi yeah. You know, Mexico City. Mexico's a mess in 68. Right. Mexico City's a mess in 68. Um, yeah. You know, the student protests there are amongst the worst in the world. Right. Um, the massacre of the students just days before the games by the government to just try to get rid of them. Right. But you flash forward to the modern games and you, you have the same thing. You know, Atlanta literally sweeping away its homeless population right. before right. opening ceremony. And, you know, we could talk about Sochi for days. Right. Berlin in 36. Well, and, and then you got Hitler. Let's, let's clean that up as much <laughs> And as you've as got Hitler. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, well, let's shift gears and talk about your new book, uh, One Goal. Sure. I think... Uh, I apologize. I have not read it. I want to read it though. I appreciate it. Appreciate uh, the desire. <laughs> it looks it looks like a great a great story. Tell me first of all, how did you? Now this is where you went to college, right? Same town. I went to college right? in that yeah, Lewiston, okay. Maine. Uh, Bates so that's how college. you heard about the, the, the story? Yes, yeah, so that's how I heard about the story. Um, and I wrote about it. I write for CNN and other popular organs occasionally, mm -hmm. um, which is a great way I think to sort of take the significance of sports and, and get it out to a wider audience. Right. Cool. Um, so I wrote about the Lewiston High School soccer team in the fall of 2015. Um, it's a team composed almost entirely of refugees. 
mostly from Somalia, which is a big part of the book. Why does Lewiston, Maine have a significant so Somali population? Why, <laughs> um, why did they go there? It was by choice. They, okay. they found Lewiston. Um, and so this team won its school's first state championship in soccer, which is not a spoiler. You go into the book absolutely knowing how right. it's going to turn out. Um, but it fall of 2015 is when the terrorist attacks in Paris took place, right. that coordinated series of bombings, the first of which was at Stade de France, um, where a friendly was going on between Germany and France. And there were rumors that were not true that that bomber who, who set off, the, who detonated in the, the tunnel of Stade de France had manipulated a Syrian refugee network to get to Belgium and then to France. Okay. And that brought out this outpouring of governors in the United States declaring that refugees were no longer going to be allowed mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in their states, including Paula Page in Maine. Um, and that struck me in a couple different ways. First is just being awful. And second, I was thinking constitutionally that that isn't even something governors can do. Mm. Um, you know, what are they talking about? You, you, you don't really get to decide who does and doesn't live in your state right. once someone is, is here legally. Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote about sort of those three points about the U.S. governors and what had happened in France and this, this refugee team in Lewiston, Maine, of all places. Um, and within a, as soon as I wrote it, I was sort of outlining a book in my head and right. thinking, I don't want this to be an academic book. I want this to be a book that I can get into the hands of every person possible, which isn't to say that there aren't academics writing incredibly accessible stuff. Right. I was sort of at a point in my career where I wanted to try something different. Um, so within about 48 hours, I was talking to an editor who ended up being the editor on the book at Hachette. Um, and as it was coming out, things in the United States were getting increasingly interesting yeah. in terms of refugees, yeah. particularly yeah. refugees from Muslim-majority countries, right. which totally Somalia right. is. Um, and immigration and borders um, to the point where it's it's been it's been a wild ride and it's been incredibly bittersweet um, mm -hmm. to be talking about this story in America right now um, but I think it's it's an important story was the uh, team like primarily was it almost all Somali 21 of the 24 varsity of the 20, uh, varsity roster was African um, the majority of which are Somali. There are some, Maine has an interesting situation in which the, the original shift of thousands were from Somalia, um, but then asylum seekers started to come. So Congo, Angola, Sudan, um, so those seeking political asylum also found their way to Maine. Okay. Um, so that has just... since ceased largely because okay. asylum seekers aren't coming to the United States anymore. Right. Um, and neither are refugees, but um, but that was that was how this diverse soccer-loving team was created in a championship hockey town. I was going to say it's not, soccer would not be the normal. No, it's like, hockey, yeah. football, and right. church. Right. <laughs> how were they? How was they accepted by the other the students? I mean, uh, that's really what the book is work? about. Yeah. It's about um, it's about sport as a connector. It's about soccer as a connector. It's about not really a typical immigrant story. It's not a story of Americanization and assimilation as, as much as negotiation amongst different peoples trying to create community in what is probably the largest demographic change in the shortest period of time in modern American history. Okay. To think about a city of 36,000 folks with a population of about 7,000 Somalis coming in. Wow. Yeah. That's, and then, so I would guess from a... <coughs> From a general standpoint, general public standpoint, there was, uh, you know, kind of a reaction to that. Too, Absolutely. Them coming in. And, Absolutely. And, and there then, are there are a lot of fractures in this community, and then there's coming together's in this community, right. um, and then you throw in economy and New England mill towns, former mill towns in New England, which have had a rough ride um, mm -hmm. for you know most of the post-war 20th into the 21st century. And so the impact on the economy, which has been generally positive okay. um, by bringing in or having folks come in um, from other places. Maine is the oldest state in the country, meaning median age. It's mm -hmm. not Florida. Everyone thinks it's Florida. Right. It's Maine. Really? You know, second whitest state and, and hemorrhaging population, hemorrhaging its young people. Yeah. And then a bunch of folks show up who want to lay roots and raise their families there and go to school there and work there. Hmm. Um, it, it, it potentially could create a turnaround um, of some kind of permanence. And a lot of them are staying. They are staying, staying there. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing what, how American, one thing about Americans, they like winners. They like to win. And that's one thing you see, not just in sports, but anything. But when a sports team can, can win something, all of a sudden you have a different 
might have a different view. Yeah, I mean, it might only be for the 90 minutes of a soccer game. Right. It might be for a season. It, it might last longer. Yeah. Um, community is a lot of work, and I think that that's probably the bottom line of, of the book is, is learning that community doesn't just happen. Community is a lot of people putting in a lot of time in a lot of different ways. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I, I remember I talked about that in my class, that you know everybody hears about the melting pot, people coming in, and just yeah. everything is great. Well, that's not really the no. reality of the history, but in sports... You might get a little of that. <laughs> you might, extent. although yeah. again, you know, the very factor of soccer becoming a marquee sport in Lewiston, Maine—that's not a melting pot, pot no. moment. That's that's, that's, that's something, something new. Else. That's something else. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Well, I can't wait to read it. I Thank you.